Okay, let's get things rock and rolling here. All right, I think we should all be able to see this. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about program design strategies. Um, some people may have seen this lecture before. We've kind of condensed it and added a couple new things to it. Um, it should take about, give or so, you know, 20 minutes or so. And of course, we'll leave time for questions because like I said, you know, these weird, unusual times, I think it's important that we kind of continue our education, make sure we can kind of talk shop with uh, both young coaches, experienced coaches, and those looking to kind of get more in the field. So um, that's what uh, we'll get started with today. All right, program design strategies. Myself and Kamal always like kind of start with um, the disclaimer. First and foremost, we know we know, we know we don't know. Um, you know, this is just one way how we like to rationalize what we do with our athletes. Uh, both myself and Coach Miles are not perfect, nor our methods perfect, but you know, we we put things in context and make sure we work with what we have, and we always reserve the right to be wrong. Right, we're always open to information, new data. So you know, that's kind of the best part about this industry is having the right to change your mind. Um, I'm building on that presentation we're doing is not the end all be all. We're always looking to seek answers to something which there isn't one. In fact, like we always like to say after these kind of presentations, um, you should have more questions and answers when things are finished. Again, that's kind of the process of learning that we found. Of course, everyone who's uh, participating right now, we assume loves the iron game. All right, so of course that's that's just the job itself. All right, so that being said, I'll let Coach Miles take things over and go from there. Miles, I think you should have the screen now. That's good. Okay, thank you. So again, pretty effective, obviously, to start with the definition of what is program design. Systematically organizing exercises using a variety of modalities around specific volume and intensity ranges to optimally adapt your athlete for their required tasks, okay? In simpler terms, it's not throwing stuff against the wall and hoping it sticks, right? It's not, hey, I saw somebody doing cleans on Instagram. Those look pretty good. We should probably do those. Squats are great. Uh, you know, bench is great. Let's, let's, uh, let's do a bunch of reps and see what happens. No, it's it's uh it's our best our best guess and our best application of all the um you know info we have available of how many sets reps what different tempos we should be using different layouts different uh, again we're not here today to tell you guys what the best periodization scheme is because we don't believe there is one periodization scheme that you have to use right again context is key context is everything there's a time and place for everything maybe you like to use a conjugate system great maybe you like triphasic great maybe you like linear block we're not here to argue those things we're just here to outline some effective uh, components of any effective program, no matter what, right? Some overarching themes and some overarching uh, commonalities that every good program will have, right? So again, without question, you should be able to justify every detail in your program card. When it says, trust us, we ask, right? That's especially applicable for our, our intern program that we run, right? For example, we had, um, last time we ran our internship, I had an athlete doing shoulder rehab and they were doing a barbell bench press, like a, a chaos style bench press where the, you know, the kettlebells are hanging by the bands off the barbell to increase the shoulder stability. In the weekly assignment, the intern put it in as their main pressing exercise. And I said, oh, this is a great exercise. What do you put that in there for? And they said, well, it's for power. So I said, okay, so now you've taken a great um, modality and you, and you maybe have applied it not in the best way. And that's not meant to demean that intern. That's just an example of taking something you see that you think is good, but you don't really understand it and just throwing it in the program for the sake of throwing it in. We have to be able to justify everything we're doing and knowing why we're doing it. Right, so then I was able to explain to them that's not really a power exercise, that's more for rehab. And then they were able to, you know, reason, reason it out, logic it out, and say, okay, now I understand why that may, may, wouldn't be the best choice in that program for that specific quality. Again, if that leads to the next question here, if you don't know why, don't write it, right? It's not, again, it's easy to get the information overload. You go on Instagram and I follow this coach and they use it, so I'm using it. But do you know why they use it? Well, no, that's not a good answer, right? You have to know the, the reason for every single thing you're putting in that program. And again, okay, advanced program design is mastery of the basics, especially with athletes, right? So much crap out there on, on especially on social media, right? That's the good and the bad of social media with people trying to reproduce what the athletes will do on the field or on the ice or on the court or the mat, whatever, in the weight room, right? We're general preparation specialists at best. That's what we do. We help build better athletes, and then their sport coach turns them into a better player of whatever whatever sport they play. So we should be trying to build robust, strong uh you know, um, explosive athletes in the weight room, build that armor up for them, especially if they're a contact sport athlete. We're not looking to reproduce, you know, someone's golf swing or baseball swing or hockey shot in the weight room. That's not the best use of our time. And that's actually doing more harm than good to our athletes, right? A simple program justified with sound logic will always be way more effective than flashy garbage that has no rhyme or reason, right? Like I said, when I say details, I mean details. Sets, reps, rest, tempo. We can justify every single thing on a program 
why we're doing it at that time of year uh, in that order in the workout, right? And we'll get to that a little bit later. Coach Matrix will go over some general guidelines of what a typical workout should look like from start to finish. But we can, we can like I said, just apply every single rest period, tempo, um, volume prescription from A all the way to E or however many blocks we have in that workout. So knowing your athlete, okay? Classic quote that we love. If you aren't assessing, you're guessing. You need to learn about your athlete and screen them if possible, okay? Uh, we like to do a full body, joint by joint approach, um, evaluating their passive and active mobility, right? Because that helps us discern between whether certain things are tight or weak, okay? If they have that full range of motion passively, but they don't have it actively, for example, that's a sign that they're weak, not that they're tight, right? If they don't even have it passively, then okay, maybe that's something that needs to be mobilized, for example. Uh, you know, as far as assessing, there's so many different things you can assess. So you can set your own key performance indicators or KPIs at the start of the program and monitor them. As long as you have something to monitor from the start to the finish of the program and you can show improvement, you're winning, okay? Some people are using uh, rep maxes, that's great. Um, you know, time sprints or, or the height of a jump or different uh, conditioning tests. You can use uh, reactive strength index. You can use a million different things. Use whatever you want in your context that fits your context that you can use effectively and measure. Just know that you have to have something to measure to that so that you can show that improvement and make your future programming decisions based off of that, right? So learn their limitations and respect them. That comes obviously from that, for us anyways, that comes a lot from that joint by joint assessment. We love overhead presses, for example, maybe, but the thing is, if your athlete can't get into, um, you know, shoulder flexion overhead without any compensations, maybe a barbell overhead press isn't the best option, okay? Maybe in that case, we're going to go to like a Viking press or a landmine press. You know, your athlete can't externally rotate their shoulder. Of course, they're going to squat somehow, but maybe it's not going to be a back squat. You know, in our, in our setting, we have safety squat bars, so we're going to use a safety squat bar. Maybe you have a front squat, uh, you know, whatever it's going to be, but it's being able to know their limitations and respect them, right? We always fit the exercise to the athlete, not the athlete to the exercise, okay? Again, and learn and understand the demands of their sport, position, and lifestyle, okay? So again, having a football background, we had one season and a long off season. So, you know, it's, it's maybe simpler to program for than a uh, track athlete who has to peak multiple times a year, right? So that obviously has to be taken into place or taken into account, sorry, uh, when, you're, when you're designing your programs and helping you program accordingly. Uh, and again, different, differentiating tightness from weakness. So again, for example, some of the passive tests we'll do include uh, ankle and big toe mobility, hip internal and external rotation, uh, shoulder range of motion, uh, T-spine rotation, right? We do hip extension, shoulder extension. So that's a passive test. That's just a little bit of a look into what we're doing. And then act, so actively, we can look at the overhead squat, the push-up, the split squat, the, the uh, clat hop test, for example. Again, these are just examples of what we do. And we can compare those results. Again, if somebody passes the passive test with flying colors, but they fail the active, now that's a sign that they're weak, right? If somebody fails all the passive tests from the get-go, we probably know that, okay, they're pretty tight, they're pretty immobile, and that will, again, help us drive our programming. So maybe shorten range of motion on certain things to begin with while we're trying to open up their hips, ankles, uh, back, uh, you know, upper back, whatever it is, and slowly progressing them to a deeper range of motion or whatever it may be, maybe elevating the heels on a squat if they got, you know, the tight ankles so that we can still hit a deep squat. Otherwise, those are just some examples there for you. Mapping a plan. Okay, so we always want to work backwards from the end goal and be prepared to modify heavily. So if I know that my athlete is starting training in April, let's say, and they have to peak in August, I want to start on that last week before August and work back, okay? The reason being, the last thing I want to do is start programming and run out of time, right? So let's say I start today, okay, it's April, and my athlete is going to be competing in, in August, or they have to be peaked by August, and I'm doing, let's say, block periodization because I have a decent amount of time, sure. Okay, so I say, okay, I start with a hypertrophy phase to start, one or two hypertrophy phases, I like three-week phases, let's say, so six weeks of that. Then I should probably go to strength, let's say, and then, okay, I'm going to go to uh, hypertrophy again, then back to strength, and then I want to go to power, and I think, oh, shit, it's July 30th, and now I realize that I ran out of time. I don't have time to get in everything that I need to get to. Simplest fix you can do is just work backwards, okay? Instead of working from today forward, work at the end goal backwards, take into account how much time you have, and go from there. That would be a much more effective strategy for you, right? And again, write the map in pencil, not pen. So even when we're writing out that big, all-encompassing uh, program, it's more of a skeleton. We may not, you know, we, we're, more, we're more than likely writing out the qualities that we want to be training at that specific time of year, 
maybe not necessarily the exercises exactly for a, for a multitude of reasons, right? For example, let's take a Olympic lifting. We really, let's say we believe in Olympic lifting. We want to use Olympic lifting with our athletes. So we put them on this continuum of how we're going to progress them and teach them how to do a, a hang clean, right? Today we start with, um, let's say, a jump shrug, and then we think next phase we're going to go to a jump shrug with a high pull, and then finally in the, in the third phase we're going to catch the bar. Some athletes might progress faster than others, so they may be able to move to that earlier, right? Some, some athletes may progress slower than others. That's fine, too. If I wrote that whole off-season note today, all the exercises I'm going to be using from here on out, and now I feel married to it, the athlete might not be able to progress appropriately. They might progress faster than I expected or slower. So I can't just write something in pen and be married to it, right? And that's just a little bit of an example. You can apply that to any exercise. Again, understand seasons and typical volume demands, right? Ebbs and flows of practices and competitions. Are you training, again, track athletes who peak multiple times a year? Um, you know, different, different sports where they play multiple seasons a year. Even today, if you're training, let's say, a football player in university that has to peak for one season versus a high school kid who plays high school in the fall and, uh, you know, travel football in the spring. Now, they have two seasons as well. So you have to know the difference even within the same sport, depending on what level they're at, how you, how you should be approaching their periodization, right? Again, don't put the cart before the horse. So program using sound principles to achieve adaptations. Again, kind of already mentioned this before, but with a lot of people trying to mimic what happens on the field or the court in the weight room, a lot of people trying to use advanced, you know, different contrast methods and uh, things like that when their athletes can't even barely do a bodyweight squat or split squat. We have to be able to master the basics first before we go to those more advanced techniques, right? Not only that, we talk about this a lot. We have a ton of, you know, we're very fortunate at our performance. We have every piece of equipment you could think of, right? Chains, bands, uh, weight releasers, you name it. If we throw all those things at the athlete on day one, will they work and will they make them better? Yes, they will. But like most things, it works the best the first time you use it. So now the problem is you use all those things right away and the athlete gets a bunch of, of um, progress. Okay, that's great. Eventually that's going to stagnate. Now we have nothing to go to, right? We've thrown everything, every single thing possible that we have at them and now they have nothing to go to. So it's about the minimum effective dose using just as much volume, intensity, again, frequency and tools that you need to get the job done. You don't need a shotgun to kill a mosquito, right? Using the minimal effective dose and always having somewhere to go so we can keep making progress. We're thinking about the long term, right? You get an athlete in high school, you're thinking about how am I going to train this kid now through their varsity career and then Fortunately for some athletes, even up into the pro career, it's not about this season upcoming only, it's about that long-term athletic development. So again, a three, three month plan is a decent starting point. You can have general phase ideas, like we said, you write that skeleton, uh, concrete objectives, knowing the intent of each cycle and considering seasonal practice volume. Again, sometimes if you're in a training camp, there might be no lifting, right? Because athletes are doing two or three a days. Uh, you know, if you're in the in-season, maybe you're obviously gonna have a little bit more frequent lifting. Again, it also depends, maybe you have players that dress every week and then players are on the practice squad. The practice squad players are probably able to lift more frequently and, and uh, more intensely, right? So that's something that you can take into account as well. Awesome. Hold up. Cool. All right. Basic principles. Uh, we always have to start with this one. It's, it's pretty straightforward, guys. Do no harm. Right, our first and foremost responsibility is the safety of our athletes. Right, if you can't make them better, don't make them worse. That's that's principle number one. All right, so safety is always a top priority uh, when it comes to programming and for your athletes. Right, again, know their limitations, know what their training age is, and all that kind of stuff. All right, now in terms of how we kind of lay out the program itself, we always want to train fast to slow, high CNS activity, low CNS activity. High priority, low priority, of course, complex is simple and large is small, right? And this is just the order of recruitment, um, getting the most bang for the buck. In terms of principles, principle specificity, all right, is pretty much identifying the stimulus you need. And then we go into overload, which is actually providing that stimulus. And then progression, of course, is how can you find a way to continually increase that stimuli, uh, like Coach Miles said, right, using the minimum effective dose, no need to kill a mosquito with a shotgun type thing, right? So we're always going fast to slow, large to small, high to priority to low priority, okay? Again, basically this is how it works in terms of how motor unit recruitment goes. Okay, so that's the most simple way we can put that. In terms of how you pick your exercise, it kind of builds on what we just talked about, complex first, and then always establishing like, what is the priority, right? What may I need to modify, regress, regress for that athlete group? Okay, you might say, all right, I want to do a back squat, but they, you know, they're, they're not used to that kind of stuff, or you, you might find yourself in a position where, you know, it's too complicated from that time. Okay, well, what 
alternatives can I come up with on the spot or in my toolbox to make it easier to learn that movement pattern and then progress from there? Or maybe you found exercise too basic and they need to actually progress a little further. How can we add a little bit more challenge to this movement pattern to then, again, increase that stimuli? So you identify the stimulus, how you overload it, and then, of course, how you can progress with you. Again, an example could be a basic squat. You can use a different box. You can change the height of that box. You could use a different bar, right? From a straight bar to a safety bar, cambered, you could dumbbell, right? If you have shoulder issues, you might use a belt squat. So there's many ways to kind of skin a cat in that respect, right? It's not simply just uh, overloading and say, oh, we're going to put weight on the bar, put more weight on the bar. You know, you have, you have a lot of tools at your disposal, right? In terms of variation, something as simple as changing a tempo, right? Changing the height of a box from a 14-inch box to 12-inch box right? Doing the same movement with a different bar. Okay. Those are all different types of stimuli that are simple enough that can, again, listen to change in effect. All right. So talking about variety can be a different stance, right? Might go from a typical back squat stance, might go for a more narrow sports squat stance, might go to a box squat and say, okay, let's widen it up a little bit. It could mean changing the grip on a bar, right? Instead of doing it over like a pronated barbell bent row, might go underhand, right? Or supinated. You might want to say the same thing on a, on a cable pull down. Okay, talking about tools and bars, like I just mentioned earlier, safety bars, straight bars, you have camera bars, Swiss bars. There's so many ways you can kind of change up a movement pattern and it changes the grip for you and the way the loads is distributed. And of course, accommodating the resistance. So bands, chains, weight releasers, right? We already talked about tempos. All these different tools and modalities are at your disposal. Okay, that could be the, the simplest variation that will, again, elicit that change in effect that we're looking for. And then when choosing those tools or those different types of um, stimuli, can your athletes learn to do it efficiently, right? How complex is it? And then of course, how long does it take to set up? If you're trying to set up, you know, this, this elaborate, let's say uh, doing banded speed pulls, for example, and you have a room full of athletes and it takes you five minutes to set the bands up and get everyone kind of accommodated. It's like, was that worth the time spent? Let's say you have an hour with your athletes, it takes you 10 minutes to set up and then another five minutes, 10 minutes, like go, every, uh, go through everything, have everyone try it you're kind of losing time here and saying, well, is there a more efficient way to do that and get the same bang for the buck, right? Obviously you want to get the most for it. You might have to like kind of give and take. It might be one of those two steps forward, one step back types of approaches, right? So a big key factor is understanding what your athlete's training age is and are they able to actually learn to do that exercise efficiently. And Coach Moss touched on this earlier. Make sure you fit the exercise to the athlete, not vice versa. Again, we're kind of beating the horse on that one there. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that the training is getting what they need first. All right, but of course, we're dealing with athletes, we're dealing with, with people that actually want to enjoy the training process. So you have to kind of meet them on both ends here and sprinkle in what they want. A nice example we like to do is like, okay, we get our, our meat and potatoes out of the way, and then of course you get dessert. So an example could be arm farm at the end, right? If you have a room full of guys that are, you know, football guys or whatever, you know, you say, hey, are we gonna do buys and tries? Hey, they have something to look forward to at the end of their lift, right? Or, you know, sometimes with females, they wanna, you know, get a bigger ass or stuff like that. So we go, okay, we'll add like an ass blast at the end of it. So all of a sudden they feel that pump or that burn in their glutes. Great, right? So it's one of those things where you, you get through the meat and potatoes and the broccoli first, and then you give them dessert at the end and it kind of keeps them motivated, right? It keeps them incentivized to go, go through that lift uh, with full effort, knowing they have something fun at the end. Now, is this always gonna be the you know most often for the training? Not necessarily, right? But again, at, at the end of the day, we're still training people. Okay, you have to kind of keep that in mind. We're not just saying, oh, buy the book, this is the best thing at this time. It's like, but we kind of got to meet them a little bit there and say, well, you know what? It keeps the people motivated. It keeps the guys, the girls, you know, excited to come in and lift. They get to look forward to that one thing. At the end of the day, is it going to be the biggest difference maker? Probably not, right? So we always have that opportunity to, to change things up. All right, I'll give this to Miles again here. One second, sorry. One second. All right, there you go. Miles, you should have control now. Yes, sir. Okay. So utilize supersets. Okay. Again, it allows for more work and less time. Now, a superset doesn't always have to be strenuous. For example, I'm not telling you that you always have to pair a squat with, um, you know, let's say like a split squat or something that I might actually take away from that main squat or, you know, I'm not always pairing a deadlift with a hip thrust or something. Again, taking away from that deadlift. What we're saying is you could even pair a squat with, again, let's say you have an athlete that failed that ankle mobility test, so they do all their squats with their heels elevated. Maybe they're hitting ankle mobility as a filler in between their main sets of squats, okay? Again, this is not strenuous. It's not gonna take away from the main work, and it's a more efficient use of time. Instead of having to give the athletes homework and say, you know, you need to really go home and stretch out your, your uh, ankles, and you know they're not gonna do it anyways, why don't you just build it into the program, and that way keep them engaged between sets anyways, again, or maybe again, a deadlift, you're doing some band pull-aparts or something in between sets. It's not taking away from the deadlift, but it's, it's, a, it's a more effective use of our time, right? Again, so examples include antagonistic, right, push-pull. You could, of course, do 
uh, dumbbell bench press in, in your accessory work with some type of bent over row. That's a great, that's a great superset, right? Compound again, squat or single leg knee dominant as your, as your A1, superset it with, again, a mobility exercise. Or of course, when you get with more advanced athletes or maybe you're in like a, a speed strength phase, for example, you could do contrast work where you are doing a heavy lift followed by something explosive. So like a heavy squat with an explosive jump or a heavy bench press with a med ball throw or apply a push up, right? Something like that. That's another great superset you could use. And again, utilizing supersets to keep flowing groups and maximize time with athletes. So again, you get a group of athletes, especially, you know, high school kids, maybe their attention span isn't the greatest. You have four athletes and they're, uh, you know, today we're squatting. You have one athlete spotting, one athlete squatting, one athlete resting and getting ready to spot. And then the other one hitting that filler, right? Hitting that mobility. Uh, that way we keep the flow, um, we keep, you keep the flow of the workout going. And then again, that way all the athletes are, are engaged, right? You don't have athletes twiddling their thumbs in between sets. Everyone's engaged. Everyone knows that they have an objective that they can be currently doing at that time. Volume, intensity, and tempo. So something that we already kind of mentioned, but we're going to get into it a little bit deeper. So volume is the most misunderstood quality of program design and also arguably the most important, okay? Again, we want to program just enough volume to listen to the effect. Again, keeping in mind the athlete's seasonal demands. And we don't need a shotgun to kill a mosquito, as we said, right? More isn't better. Better is better. So considering Prilipin's chart, if you haven't heard of Prilipin's chart, basically it's a chart um, recorded by A.S. Prilipin. He was a weightlifting coach. And he coached thousands of athletes and, and he was able to figure out optimal uh, volume demands or sorry, uh, volume prescriptions, I should say, based on different uh, percentage of your one rep max brackets. So, for example, if you're lifting at 90% of, or above, he determined that during a workout, you should be able to hit uh, between one and 10 total reps, one to two reps per set, with the optimal number of total reps being seven in that workout. So, again, can you hit? Eight or nine reps in that workout? Yes, sure you can. Uh, can. You know, can you hit four or five only? Sure you can. But again, he was able to determine that the optimal number would be seven, for example. Again, could you hit triples? Sure you could, right? Three reps per set. But he was able to determine that optimally, one to two reps per set at 90 or more percentage of your one rep max was the optimal uh, amount of volume per set. Again, so when we say train minimally, or sorry, train optimally, we don't train minimally or maximally. We train optimally. It means, again, so... With that total number of reps being no more than 10, could we hit 12 to 15 reps at 90 or, or above? Sure, maybe, right? But is that reproducible over time, week to week? Probably not. We won't be able to recover from that, right? And again, just because we could maybe hit those doesn't mean we should. We can get the we can get the training effect that we want <laughs> the total risk by hopefully just hitting that um, that prescribed optimal volume uh, and the total number of reps and reps per set. Okay, again. Speed and strength, this is our bullet and dump truck analogy. Whether you get hit by a bullet or a dump truck, they're both going to kill you, right? But again, comparing it to that Pelican's chart, we might be hitting one to three reps per set. If we're using 85 or 90%, we have to know that that's our dump truck. That's our max strength, right? That's, our, that's a certain training effect. If we're doing, let's say, 50 to 60% still for only one to three reps, well, that's the same amount of volume, but now it's a totally different training effect, right? The, whole, the stimulus is, is completely different. Now it's power. So we have to to know just because we have a certain volume, we have to know how it coincides with the specific intensity and what the training effect is, is, is going to be, right? Again, similar reps, different intensities, different intent. And utilizing tempos appropriately. So Coach Matrix, I think, mentioned that we have our eccentric, our isometric, and our concentric uh, muscle actions. And we have to know when and why we're training each one uh, in a specific way. So what does it mean? For example, eccentrics, we use to build structural changes and force absorption, right? So if we're doing high rep sets, with slow, with slow eccentrics, that's going to have a lot more structural changes, right? Hypertrophy, building muscle. Like if we're using those same long eccentric uh, reps, but we're doing less reps per set, that's more for force absorption, right? Obviously, that's going to be key for athletes. Again, now isometrics for a stronger amortization phase and percent, prevent bleeding force. So again, amortization phase meaning that time between the eccentric and the concentric. So let's say for a squat, my eccentric, I'm sitting down. There's that brief period where I'm not moving up or down because I'm getting ready to stand up. And then the concentric is that I'm standing up, okay? Or now applied to athletes when they're jumping, right? They load up, they drop down, they load up, that's eccentric. The isometric is when I'm about to switch to that jump. And then I jump, that's a concentric. So if I'm stronger isometrically, that little portion in between is more, is, is more solid. Again, I'm not bleeding force and I'm a more efficient athlete. You can apply that to, you know, sprinting, whatever athletic endeavor you want, okay? Even better, cutting. I break down to do a cut. 
eccentric is I'm dropping my center of gravity, right? I'm absorbing that force. There's a brief uh, period of time where I'm uh, changing direction. And then concentric, I'm into my next move. Again, if I'm solid in that isometric, I'm able to, to change direction more quickly. And that's obviously going to be a super effective tool for any athlete, no matter what sport you're playing. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Coach Matrix, and uh, we're going to continue on. Sweet. All right. So how do we kind of put it all together? All right, so these next couple of slides, we, we kind of go from um, – identifying like the essential six movement patterns, then we kind of narrow it down to, you know, how we can we build an exercise library and then how do we actually put this into a framework that's actually usable. All right, so there's always different variations, but here's like a simple way we like to do it. We like to break it down to six essential movement patterns, squatting, hinging, pressing, pulling, lunging, and carries. And then we kind of branch off from there like a network. So you guys can see on the screen here, squats be broken down to bilateral and unilateral with different examples in between. All right, there's just a couple of them. Same with hinges. We can consider those like hybrids or hip dominant, right? And you can even break that up even further into hip dominant, unilateral, hip dominant, bilateral. Uh, again, you can kind of branch off in whatever direction you want to go, but this is just some examples for you. Same with presses and pulls, right? Both horizontal and vertical. You can see obviously bench presses and inclines, push ups are all horizontal, vertical, overhead presses, bar dips, that kind of thing. And we just kind of go down the line here as well. Lunges being horizontal, vertical, step ups, or straight, ver uh, horizontal, and reverse lunges. Upright and, ver and friction based carries, right? So you can see upright being anything from farmer's walks or suitcase carries, and friction based carries we call like sleds drags and that kind of thing. Now, why is this important? Well, when you have a framework of essential movements, you can build a better exercise database, which gives you again, more tools in your toolbox. All right, so if we go on the second slide here, you can see this is just a couple examples um, from our exercise library of different things. So for example, vertical presses, horizontal pulls, goes from squats, hinges, lunges, and we have this, this in a very extensive list, right? This is just a screenshot of them. And obviously you can see that we have some Olympic lifting there, some jumps and some throw examples, some shoulder rotation arms. Essentially what you can do with those movement patterns is you can build a giant database, okay? And you can make it extensive. So now you have options, right? Let's say you have to do a heavy squat day, an athlete has a cast on, they say, oh, so coach, I broke my arm. Well, no problem, we can go to belt squats or okay, we can, we can try the safety bar. We can do, you know, a goblet squat if a different athlete has, you know, bad thoracic or like that. So we have a database here that we can use, okay, to draw tools out when we need them, right? And again, this is very important because once you identify essential movement patterns, you can make it, pl makes it plug and play very easy. So for example, here we have a simple modified tier system skeleton. I uh, would break it down into day one, day two, day three, just a three day example. Day one being a total priority or a hinge priority, and then day two is lower or squat priority, and then day three is your upper or bench priority, right? So obviously your A and your B block are gonna be both your, primor, uh, your primary lifts. So for example, in day one, you say, all right, I wanna make sure we get some sort of Olympic lift or hinge lift in as my priority. And of course you can superset that with a core choice. Now, if you know back to the previous screen, you say, okay, well, what's some of our O lift op like, uh, options we can choose from? And then what do we think is best for the, for the athlete group they're working with? Same with your squat. Well, your squats are secondary. Okay, well, if we know we're doing a heavy back squat on day two, for example, right? Maybe we'll do a front squat as our secondary. And of course your superset could be a hinge, maybe switch it up and say, okay, well, I want to make sure I do some single leg hinge work. All right, well, let's go down the list and see what we can have for options. All right. And again, you just kind of plug and play with all your, your blocks, right? It makes it really easy to kind of funnel it down. And you can see at the end there, right, in your D block, you can say, all right, I want to focus on posterior chain work. I want to focus on some trunk work. I want to focus on give them a fun day, arms or shoulders. And you can always mix and match, right? This is just a simple suggestion, but you can say, well, if we have all our priorities in place, maybe we can pepper in some fun stuff at the end. All right, well, on Friday, we'll do like a flex Friday type thing. The guys at the heavy bench at the end, we'll do arm farm type thing to kind of keep them going, right? Or you say, you know what, we need to really focus on, on our uh, back end here. We'll do uh, back extensions, we'll glute ham raises, and we'll do some sort of carry, right? And you can kind of pepper those in your D block, same by using the database you've already built earlier. So now you have a whole bunch of options and you can just kind of pick, plug, and play. And it makes it a lot easier to actually design efficient programs in less time time right and again this is just one simple modified skeleton you don't have to use this right you can even extend it into a day like a four-day program right you might do uh lower upper and then upper lower right it depends on how you want to do your splits um this is just a good idea to kind of do a total body workout in terms of a three-day plan right but once you have like that foundation say okay how do i want to organize or how do i want to map this out it makes it easier and more efficient to program 
all right? Because all you have to do is essentially break down your movement patterns into different planes, and then you just have to add as many exercises or variations and tools that you know of into a giant database. And then from there, you have a system where you can kind of plug it in and say, okay, what do you think is best? And then you can obviously modify or regress. If you know you have to do a squat priority, maybe a back squat is too hard, okay, well, let's go to a goblet squat. Or if you know a front squat is too difficult, say, all right, we can go to a belt squat or something like that. So it makes it a lot easier not only build the program itself, but also modify and adapt as you need to. Okay, so that's kind of plugging it all together. So we have your essential six moving patterns, you break it into a database from planes, and then you can build a framework depending on how many days a week you want to train, and then you can plug and play from there. All right. All right, guys, that kind of summarizes the PowerPoint size of the presentation. So now we're going to, let me see, stop sharing the screen here. If you guys have any questions, obviously pass this. There's our emails on the screen or social media tags. You can always reach out to us through that. So you'll stop sharing the screen now. We'll unmute everybody who's in the room currently, and we'll, we'll answer any questions or go to the chat room if there's any questions at all, right? I think we got everybody unmuted, I think. I believe so. can't really remember, but we'll figure it out. If there's any questions, guys, shoot them out into the chat room. I don't know how this kind of stuff works, to be honest with you, but we will figure that out, I think. Did I mute, Miles? What's up, right. I have a question. Um, I kind of have a tough time differentiating. Um, for example, when, when you're talking about tightness versus weakness, um, I, for me, it's uh, difficult to kind of differentiate what, when to do uh, flexibility and when to strengthen the muscle, um, right. whether it's because sometimes a muscle is tight because it's weak. Um, so I was wondering, is it that you kind of uh, talked about it? Do you use as a rule like, okay, if you can get through the range of motion passively, then um, it's a weakness problem. So we know to strengthen the muscle that we're putting through the range of motion um or is it okay you can't for example if you do like a straight leg raise and uh your, your hamstring's too tight um how do you get, differentiate like what is tight and weak basically yeah so that's a good question so with our fortunately for you with our internship you'll you'll learn it but the way we do it like so for example if we go through a test we have objective um measures or standards for every single test that we do if an athlete passes big toe and ankle mobility they can extend their hip they can internally and externally rotate their hip they can uh, they have full hip flexion they have full uh, thoracic extension okay and they go and fail an overhead squat and they came over that's a weak thoracic spine right if they, if they if they pass our thoracic extension test that we do in our rotation there's no reason why they should fail that overhead squat from the thoracic region right so they go ahead and fail it that's that's a that's an indicator of weak uh, a weak t uh, weak scapular retractus for example right you get the again they they pass the uh, hip internal external rotation uh, they pass the ankle and big toe mobility. They go into the overhead squat, and you see the heels uh, rotate. So the hip is externally rotating as they, as they descend into the squat. There's another red flag of weakness right there, right? We know it's on tightness because they, they pass based on our, our objective measures, right? We go like, uh, for example, external rotation. Uh, for most people, roughly 60 to 65 degrees external rotation, 40 to 45 degrees in, uh, hip inter internal rotation. They pass both those things. There's no reason why, from a mobility standpoint, that they should be externally rotating or moving at all on the way down in their squat. Makes sense? That's just like a little bit of an example. We have, again, it's full body from, uh, from toe up to head, but that's just an example how you can kind of differentiate. So kind of through process eliminations, that how the kind of assessment battery set up so that you can isolate by kind of putting the results of different tests together? That's a fair, yeah, that's a fair way to put it. And again, like everybody's going to squat somehow. Everybody's going to hinge somehow. Everyone's going to press somehow. The Coach Matrix had that uh, excellent graphic there about all the, all the uh, movement patterns. Everybody's hitting all, all them in the program in different proportions, right, depending on what they need. But it's just, again, how can we modify that exercise for that athlete? Like Coach said, a can't, uh, uh, an athlete can't extend their T-spine or they can't externally rotate their shoulder. In our setting, because we have a safety swap bar, or well, three of them, we can use the safety spot bar. Maybe somebody else doesn't have that, so they have a different a different solution. But the whole point is, or again, uh, you know, different shoulder issues. We have a Swiss bar that they can press with, or they can't get into uh, flexion, right? Uh, shoulder flexion overhead. Maybe they're doing like a landmine press, like I said, or or a Viking press. But everybody's still going to be doing over like a, a, a vertical press in some way. Makes sense. So that just helps. It just helps really guide your exercise selection because you realize that you know 
like I said, overhead press with a barbell, great exercise, back squat, great exercise. But what do you do when you get a client or athlete that can't do it? You just don't press or you don't squat? Well, of course you do. You just find a, a, a actionable solution that can, that they can use that will be safe and effective for them. Right. And again, again, a lot of people eventually can progress to maybe that strict overhead press, or they can progress to that back squat. Maybe just not right away. We can still be having them squat. Is that fair? Yep. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. That's some, that's a good summary of it right there. I agree on that. Any other questions? Zero, Nana? I got another one. Um, I know, okay. Okay. So I came across this question on a test actually, and um, I feel it kind of tights, uh, uh, circle, uh, circles in, ties in with the tightness and weakness thing. Um, and I didn't know that this was that much of a thing, but differentiating, I guess, flexibility from mobility. Um, yeah. Can you not have like it? My understanding is like you can't have one without the other. Um, is there like some? Are you? Is there a way to I guess isolate one or the other, or um, manipulate either one to accomplish a certain goal? Because like I always kind of said, like I always looped them in together as basically being similar, if not the same thing. Like yeah. you can't have mobility if you don't have flexibility. So I was just wondering, like, is there like a line that's drawn between the two terms? So that's a, that's a decent statement. You can't have mobility without flexibility, but you can definitely have flexibility without mobility, right? Okay. So mobility is being able to control all the range of motion that you passively have. So again, you, you had a good, a good example right there with that straight leg test. If, again, if I lay on your back and I take your, you have your straight leg and I take it up to, let's say 90 degrees hip flexion, but then you go on your own and I say, okay, Paul, raise your leg and you can only get it up 45. So I mean, you're flexible, but you're not mobile because you can't control all the passive range that you have. Okay. Makes sense? If I, again, if we're doing the, uh, what do you call it? We're doing the, the assessment screen at Coach Matrix. Let's say I'm laying on my back and Coach Matrix takes my shoulder and he can put it to 90 degree external rotation. But then I flip over and lay on my stomach and I have to actively do it against gravity and I can't get there. Again, you could argue I'm flexible, but I'm not mobile because I don't have control of all that passive range when I go to do it actively. So now that sets us up for an injury mechanism. If you look up like, Functional range conditioning, for example, that's a whole school of like uh, mobility training, essentially, and that's what it's all predicated on: being able to um, actively control every inch of passive range that you have, right? Even then, a lot of people can hit a deep squat passive, and, and that's passive because a lot of that is going to be from gravity. But if you ask them to pick their their, their knee up, do like a high knee up towards their chin, a lot of them can't. And they can't match what they can hit in a deep squat. So again, that's passive versus active. A million different examples you could use, but. So flexibility is fine, but flexibility without mobility, without control, is pretty much useless, right? Yeah. And that's really ha – having a big gap between those two is, is, a, is, a, is a recipe for injury. Yeah. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Elena, you got to have something. I know. I'm always full of questions. Um, no, I mean, this is very aligned with kind of how I approach programming. It's just always great to hear it from a different perspective and a different voice. Um, yeah, I mean, I just enjoy learning and, and, uh, hearing what you guys are up to, but no questions are popping up. I know, I know where to go though. If I do have questions. Yeah, sure. Fair cool. enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I agree. All right then. Well, if there's nothing else, I think we're good to go. All right. All right, folks. Well, I appreciate y'all tuning in. Um, Again, we're, we're always about, I know these times are uncertain, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we're, we're always looking to kind of keep webinars going on every couple of weeks or so. We're uh, working on progress and kind of building on the program design type stuff. So maybe like diving deeper into conjugate or more advanced methodologies. Um, but we'll hear that out in the next couple of weeks or so. And um, you guys are always welcome to tune into that as well. So the more we keep learning these weird times, the better off pair will be when uh, things resume back to like a regular normal life, right? So as best as possible, hopefully. All right, so if there's no other questions, you guys go always email us. If not, you guys are good to go. Thanks for tuning in, and until uh, next time. All right? Thanks. Take care, guys. Bye.